thank you very much uh, to the organizers. It's a great pleasure to uh, speak here. It's my first uh, appearance in the Number Theory sem uh, Number Theory Web Seminar, so it's, I'm very happy to be doing this. Uh, so the title of my talk is uh, it's, a, it's about explicit class field theory and a connection with orthogonal groups. And most of what I'll be talking about today is uh, joint work with Jan Vonk. And since it's a, the, the format of the uh, web seminar is a bit impersonal, we don't get to, to meet each other in person. So I wanted to at least um, uh, put my, the, the, pic, the picture of my collaborator here as my first slide. Uh, okay, so the, the idea is to, to uh, try to generalize a very classical theory, the theory of uh, complex multiplication, which concerns the values of modular functions at CM points uh, to other settings, like the setting of real quadratic fields. And so a singular modulus is simply a value of a modular function, like the J function being the most uh, classical and standard example, uh, add a quadratic imaginary argument of the upper half plane. So, so something like uh, a tau here of discriminant D, where D is a negative, say, fundamental discriminant. And uh, the value of the J function at such a tau uh, has all kinds of nice algebraic properties. It generates, it belongs to the Hilbert class field of the corresponding imaginary quadratic field. And it has an interesting, highly structured factorization. Uh, so uh, for example, uh, the value of J at one plus root minus 23 over two, an element of discriminant minus 23, satisfies this uh, uh, cubic polynomial with rather large integer coefficients and likewise, for j of one plus root minus 31, we have this kind of uh, uh, value that, that satisfies. And these two polynomials are interesting. Their splitting fields are the Hilbert class fields of the corresponding quadratic imaginary fields. And while the coefficients seem to be very large, uh, when you look at the constant uh, terms of both of them, you see that they have, uh, that they really factor into small primes, price of small primes with large multiplicities. Now, the fact that J of tau belongs to the Hilbert class field implies in particular that its value at any tau corresponding to a quadratic imaginary field of class number one uh, belongs is an integer, is an actual uh, integer. And you can see this, here's the value of J of tau at all the quadratic imaginary tau's corresponding to uh, class number one imaginary quadratic fields. And you see that their values are integers which are highly factorizable. So they, although they're quite large, their uh, largest prime factor is in fact uh, quite small. In this case, uh, the prime factor is strictly, the largest prime factor is strictly smaller than the discriminant of the corresponding tau. And this kind of behavior persists also if you subtract from J of tau, the value of J at any other uh, quadratic imaginary argument. So for example, here if I translate J of tau by 1728, which is the value of the J function at I, then I get the following table, where again, I see the, the same kind of uh, phenomena. Uh, here, the largest prime factor is never larger than the discriminant of the corresponding tau. So you have this. Now, um, th that previous slide suggests that the natural quantity to study really is the difference of J values at two distinct uh, quadratic imaginary arguments. So if we fix two such things, tau one and tau two, you might want to assume for simplicity that the discriminants are pair are relatively prime to each other. Then you might study this fat, this quantity j of tau one minus j of tau two. And uh, it was studied very classically. You'll see examples in the, the, the uh, standard, the, the classical uh, treatises of Klein and Fricke on modular functions where certain values are studied and, and uh, and, and, and then, of course, this difference of singular moduli also plays a key role in a seminal paper of Gross and Zagier from the 1980s, which has sort of uh, motivated a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Now, the theorem of Gross Zagier concerns the factorizations of these differences of uh, singular moduli. So, if Hj is the Hilbert class field of the corresponding imaginary quadratic field, then the theorem asserts that if I take the difference j of tau one minus j of tau two that belongs to the compositum now of the two uh, Hilbert class fields of q square root d one and q square root d two, and if I take its norm down to q, I get a, a, a an integer, and I take its a, a absolute value, then I can write that integer, of course, as a product of primes to certain with certain multiplicities, and the theorem says something about what that factorization looks like, namely. It says that the primes that appear in this product 
always divide a positive integer of the form d1, d2 minus a square over four. In particular, uh, the largest prime factor never divide, is never larger than d1, d2 over four. So that's the first thing that, that uh, you have. And moreover, these primes have certain uh, constrained splitting behaviors in the two imaginary quadratic fields. They're either uh, inert or ramified in each of q square root of d1 and q square root of d2. So these are patterns that you will see for all these uh, factorizations. And the theorem of gross idea is more precise. It even gives a precise formula for the exponents ML that appear in this factorization. So it's a completely explicit recipe for the factorization. And I'll give you a, a little, little bit of a, uh, since this is meant to be a, a kind of a general, almost colloquium style uh, talk for a broad audience, I want to give you a, an idea of the geometric uh, explanation underlying this, this phenomenon. So uh, if we uh, consider the difference j of tau 1 minus j of tau 2, and we consider primes that divide the norm of this difference, well, these j of tau 1 and j of tau 2 can be interpreted as a j invariance of elliptic curves with complex multiplication by these the corresponding orders, the corresponding maximal orders in the quadratic fields. And if L divides this norm, that means that these two uh, elliptic curves have the same reduction, modulo L, or rather modulo prime of the Hilbert class fields that lies above L. And so there's some elliptic curve over the algebraic closure of FL, uh, which uh, is the simultaneous reduction of these two elliptic curves. So that means, in particular, that if we look at the endomorphism rings of A1 and A2, those two endomorphisms in, in inject into the endomorphism ring of the special fiber, which is therefore quite large, since it, it contains two different uh, quadratic imaginary orders of different discriminants. And the only way that can happen is if the endomorphism ring of this uh, elliptic curve over FL bar is an order in a quaternion algebra of discriminant L. And so... Um, and, and an order that contains elements, omega-1 and omega-2, having these discriminants, d1 and d2. Now, that, of course, places a large constraint on the kind of elliptic curve we can have. The curve has to have multi, a super singular reduction at L. And if we now take these two elements, omega-1, omega-2, and consider the pairing matrix associated to them, I mean, this endomorphism ring is endowed with a natural quadratic form given by the, the trace form then uh, you can compute the discriminant. The determinant of that pairing matrix is d1, d2, minus t squared over 4. And because this uh, is a lattice in a definite quaternion algebra, that discriminant has to be positive. And it also has to be divisible by the prime L, because essentially because the quaternion algebra is ramified at L. And that, of course, places a constraint on the prime L. Then it has to divide this expression, as was asserted in the, the theorem of Gross and Zegge. Okay. Now, I want to uh, formulate a real... Um, I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah. May, may I ask, do, do you have a converse? If you take the intersection of all the endomorphism rings over which which contain all the Ls such that the endomorphism contains two copies of A1 and A2, do you recover all the divisors of the norm of the difference? It's a little bit more complicated, but as I said before, I mean, that gives you a list of suspects, of course, but then... Uh, in, in the in the work of Gross and Zagier, there's a formula for this exponent ML that arises. And I do not think that all the integers, which would satisfy these two conditions, which I wrote here, will necessarily have an ML non-zero. Okay. So for further, it's, it, it's not, I don't think you can rule out the fact that some of these Ls could actually not appear. So these are necessary but not sufficient conditions for an L to appear in the factorization. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. So, uh, so now I know. So, so now what I want to talk about is an extension of this story to the setting where the imaginary quadratic fields are replaced by real quadratic fields. And the goal then is to define a quantity, J of tau 1, tau 2, which is going to behave like a difference of, of singular moduli. And the key differences in this construction are going to be, firstly, that this, rather than having an analytic function like J, which involves uh, Archimedean uh, limits, uh, it will be defined by, by a piadic limiting process. So it'll be a, a piadic construction rather than a complex analytic one. And the second key difference, which is very much at, at the heart of what we're, we're, we're you know, puzzled by, is that we lack an arithmetic geometric understanding of the construction analogous to what we have 
uh, coming from the theory of elliptic curves with complex multiplication. Okay. Uh, so to describe the formula, so I want to. Yeah, I want to give a, a, a very down-to-earth uh, description of this function. It's, it's, it's a little bit less, um, uh, how can I say it? It's, it's, it's a bit less fine than the than the finest invariant we can define, but, it, but the advantage is that it, we can actually sidestep a lot of the formalism that's involved in, in uh, yeah, so we'll, I'll, I'll explain it now. Okay, so we have this local Green's function. Uh, which we can associate to a pair of real quadratic uh, arguments. So I'm going to let tau going to tau prime be the natural involution, which sends the square root of dj to its negative. And uh, I'm going to, so, so to any real quadratic tau, I can associate a geodesic on the Poincaré upper half plane, which is simply the geodesic joining the point tau to its conjugate tau prime. So that's like a semicircle, uh, you know, joining those two points, which lie on the boundary of the uh, complex upper half plane. Okay, and so you have the so you have a, you have tau one and tau two. You get this pair of geodesics, gamma one and gamma two, and you can consider their topological intersection on the upper half plane H. So these two geodesics either they intersect or they don't. I mean, if they're like this, they, and um, the intersection number is either zero, one, or minus one. So it's just an intersection on that. Uh, non-compact uh, symmetric space attached to SL2R. Now, uh, we can associate a local Green's function to the pair tau1, tau2 by looking, by considering this expression. It's essentially tau1 minus tau2. It's the difference of tau1 and tau2 multiplied by its algebraic conjugate in the numerator. And then in the denominator, you just normalize by this factor, which is comparatively less important, tau1 minus tau1 prime and tau2 minus tau2 prime. So this is just some algebraic number, which belongs to the compositum of q square root d1 and q square root d2, so to, to this biquadratic field. But then we weight this uh, contribution by the topological intersection of gamma 1 and gamma 2, which means that if our pair tau 1, tau 2, if their corresponding geodesics do not intersect, then the Green's function simply takes the value 1. Okay, so it has a trivial value. And so this, by its very definition, it belongs to the biquadratic field, but then you look at its invariance property under tau goes to tau prime, and you see that it actually belongs to this distinguished quadratic subfield of the biquadratic field. And uh, uh, it's easy to see from the definition that this uh, Green's function is a point pair invariant. If you simultaneously translate tau one and tau two by an element alpha in SL2Q, the, this expression here is essentially a cross ratio of the four elements, tau one, tau two, and their conjugates and therefore is invariant under translation. And likewise, this exponent here is, uh, I mean, the SL2Q acts as hyperbolic isometries on the upper half plane. So it preserves the intersection number. So, okay, so we have this property. And now, now we're gonna define a global multiplicative Green's function by simply taking the product of these local ones over suitable translates of uh, the, these the tau's. So the group gamma, which is SL2Z, which I'm just going to denote by gamma, acts on the real quadratic elements, of course, by Mobius transformations in the usual way. And it acts on the set of two by two matrices with integer coefficients, by both by left and right multiplication. So I can now denote by gamma one and gamma two the stabilizers in SL2Z of, the, of these real quadratic elements, tau one and tau two. These groups turn out to be of rank one. They're, they're cyclic, essentially cyclic groups of rank one with the generator of modulo torsion, which is given by the fundamental units of the core or by matrices whose eigenvalues are the fundamental units of the corresponding real quadratic fields. Okay, so we have that. And then I'm going to define G sub M of tau one, tau two to be the product over all matrices of determinant M. Um, uh, running over this double coset. So I take a matrices modulo gamma one on the left and gamma two on the right of the local Green's function evaluated tau one and alpha tau two. Okay, so it's clear that this expression here depends only on the value of alpha mod gamma one on the left and gamma two on the right. It's easy to check from the equivariance properties of this expression. And so I take the, the, the product over all uh, uh, alpha of determinant n. Now this could still be an infinite product because the indices over which it's running, uh, there are this double coset space uh, consisting of element of matrices determinant M modulo gamma one and gamma two on the left and right. 
is an infinite set, but the, the, the way that I define this local greens function by decreeing that it would contribute a one whenever uh, the corresponding geodesics do not intersect actually cuts this down to a finite product. In particular, it's a finite product of elements in this, in this, in this quadratic field. So the final outcome is just an element of Q square root D1, D2. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm saying here. It's really just a finite product, really, of uh, these local groups. That, that's the importance of this uh, factor, this weighting factor given by the, the, the topological intersection at infinity. And okay, so it belongs to this quadratic field. Okay, so now to make this interesting, we will need some kind of to bring in some kind of analysis. And so we're going to try to uh, consider piadic limits of these expressions. We do this by introducing a prime P which for simplicity, I'm going to assume that it's inert in both of the real quadratic fields. So both D1 and D2 are non-quadratic residues. I could also have that P divides the discriminant, but that's, I'll ignore that case for now. And so this is, if this is true, then the prime P actually splits in the quadratic field Q square root D1, D2. And therefore I can consider both the local Greens function and this product G sub M as elements of QP by choosing a prime of Q square root D1, D2, which lies above the rational prime P, okay? And uh, now what I'm gonna consider, instead of just taking GM, I'm going to consider the product GM P to the N. So where now I take the product over all matrices of determinant M times a power of P. And the idea is gonna be to, to grow this power of P, okay? So this is still an element of QP, it's still given by a finite product of uh, things, but this finite product, of course, is getting larger. It's involving more and more terms as N grows. And we're gonna be interested then in, this li in these limits. We take N go to infinity of GMN evaluated on tau one, tau two. And that's what I, that's what I denote by J sub M of tau one, tau two. So we, we wanna consider these limits when they exist. As a first theorem, um, about real quadratic singular moduli. So I'm gonna first assume for simplicity that the prime P is two, three, five, seven, or 13, which is equivalent to the fact that the modular curve level P, X naught of P has genus zero or equivalently that there are no weight two cusp forms on gamma naught of P. Okay, and then the theorem, which Jan and I, uh, uh, yeah, this is the theorem of, of Jan Vonk and, and I, is that this limit, the limit of GMN as n goes to infinity exists in QP. So it's a well-defined piadic number. And it has an interesting uh, algebraicity property. First, it belongs to this compositum of the two narrow Hilbert class fields of uh, the, the two real quadratic fields up to torsion. And furthermore, if I take m equals one, this quantity j1 tau one tau two exhibits exactly the same sorts of factorization patterns as we saw in the difference of uh, uh, singular moduli in the theorem of Gross and Zagier, when the tau one and tau two are imaginary rather than real. Okay, so we'll see that the, the it's the same kind of phenomena that arise that the primes that divide this difference are rather small and less than the product of discriminants, essentially over p, etc. So there's a theorem very analogous to the one of Gross and Zagier, the governing these quantities. Okay. Uh, now I say a word about what happens for general P. So this, this restriction, of course, is very strong. You might want to ask what, what, if, what if there are cusp forms of level P? Well, we can consider this space of um, so-called weakly holomorphic modular functions on gamma naught of P. These are modular forms of weight zero, modular functions. And uh, we require them, we allow them to have poles at the cusps. But if, so gamma naught of P, X naught of P, rather the modular curve, has two cusps, usually denoted zero and infinity. And we still require that these uh, functions be regular at the cusp zero. So they have a single pole, which is at the cusp infinity. Okay. And so that's the space which we're going to be considering. And now if I write, if I take such an element in M0 shriek gamma naught of P, I can write it as a Laurent expansion in Q, each of the two pi i tau. And there's going to be a, a sort of Laurent series part, a principal part, and uh, this other piece. And so these coefficients AM of the principal part, if I take such a thing and I assume that the coefficients are in actually integers, then I can consider a way, a, a, a kind of multiplicative combination of the GMNs 
weighted by these coefficients am that appear in the principal part of this weakly holomorphic modular form of weight zero, weak, weakly holomorphic modular function. So I do this, and I call this g sub phi of n, because it's governed, of course, by the form, the function phi. And the next theorem is that I can then take the difference of these g phi n's of tau 1, tau 2, and I'll call that j, j sub phi of tau 1, tau 2. And that limit exists as a piadic number, and it belongs to the compositive of the two uh, Hilbert class fields. Now, the way you might want to think about this j phi is as a kind of uh, piadic Borchard's lifts of the uh, weekly, sorry, of, of the um, weekly holomorphic modular function phi. So it's, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to ex explain more of that when I, when I talk about the uh, eventual generalization of this uh, framework. Uh, okay, so, so now I want to, one thing I want to do in this, in this uh, lecture is give it an idea of the ideas that go into the proof of this theorem, give some kind of outline. Uh, and it actually helps to actually recast the, the formula in a broader setting, uh, which is inspired, in fact, by two, uh, two things. So the first is a uh, the theory of what we call rigid meromorphic co-cycles for orthogonal groups. So this is something that I developed uh, that with uh, Leonard Gehrman and Mike Lipnowski about a year or two ago. Um, and, and so the goal is to sort of extend the notion of rigid meromorphic fun. I mean, these rigid meromorphic co-cycles are meant to play the role of uh, meromorphic modular functions in the setting of uh, for, for things like real quadratic fields. And one can try to generalize them to, to general uh, orthogonal groups. So that was the first source of inspiration for the formulas I'm now going to, to describe that are more general. And the second was, were the calculations that arose in uh, the PhD thesis of Romain Branchereau uh, that, that was defended uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago. Uh, yeah, so those are the two things that I, I had. And, and I'll try to explain that a little bit. Uh, so the idea is to think of the previous formula as having something to do with a quadratic space of rank four and signature two, two. So now I want to uh, look at higher rank uh, quadratic spaces. So the basic object behind the construction is going to be a free Z module of rank two R uh, equipped with a bilinear form from V cross V to Z, a Z valued bilinear form. And the a uh, basic assumption is that the tensor product of this lattice, V, with the reals is a real quadratic space of signature RR, which means that when you write the quadratic form in a, in a diagonal form over R, you have R plus signs and R minus signs. So it's a, it's a quadratic form of that uh, signature. And I'm going to assume for simplicity, this is not an essential assum assumption, it just makes statements a little bit cleaner, that this lattice has discriminant one. So the pairing actually identifies V with its Z linear dual. Uh, now, the orthogonal group of this uh, quadratic lattice is defined over Z. It is even smooth over Z because of this assumption on the discriminant. And uh, the, the main case that was of interest in the setting of real quadratic singular moduli, as I sort of said at the beginning, is that is the case where the quadratic space is M2 of Z, the space of two by two matrices with integer entries equipped with the trace form. So A paired with B is just a trace of A, B star, and B star is the so-called adjugate of B, the, the inverse of B times the determinant, if you want. And uh, there's a natural action. There's a, a SL2 cross SL2 acts on M2 of Z by simultaneous left and right multiplication. So UV acts on A by UV, U, AV inverse. And that group action determines a homomorphism from SL2 cross SL2 to G, which is defined over Z in this. Uh, and so in so the, the framework I'm about to describe now, when you specialize this setting, you will recover the formulas that I wrote down earlier. Okay, now this quadratic space uh, of rank 2R comes as, it has naturally associated to it two different kinds of symmetric spaces. So firstly, there's an Archimedean symmetric space, which is very standard in the when, in the theory of uh, Shimura varieties or, or uh, spaces associated to orthogonal groups. One can consider uh, X infinity to be the, set, the collection 
of all maximal negative definite plane, R planes, R dimensional subspaces of VR. So because of the signature, the maximum dimension of the negative definite subspaces R, and you can look at this collection of all these spaces. And so it's a kind of subs subspace of the Grassmannian of uh, R dimensional subspaces of VR. And it turns out that that space is a real, has a natural structure of a real manifold of dimension R squared. Okay. Uh, and there's also a piadic symmetric space associated to V, which is now going to be a, a kind of rigid analytic uh, space. So this space, which I'm going to denote by XP, is identified with the set of isotropic lines in the tensor product of V with CP. So I take CP, to be, which is the completion of the algebraic closure of QP, and I tensor V by that to make it into a, a vector space of, of dimension 2R over CP. And I look at all the lines in this quadratic space, which are isotropic. And I subtract from that the set of lines, uh, the set of uh, lines which are spanned by vectors, which are orthogonal to some QP isotropic line, some, to some vector which is isotropic, but defined over QP. So I remove all the orthogonal complements of uh, isotropic lines defined over QP. And so that's my symmetric space. And that's, that turns out to be a rigid analytic space as a natural structure of a rigid analytic space of dimension 2R minus 2. So you can see that the, um, the way that these two symmetric spaces are defined is are rather not uh, parallel. The dimensions are quite different and the way that we define. So th th there's a feeling that perhaps the, the construction is not, I would be a bit hard pressed to give a very a strong conceptual justification for why we made these definitions. They seem to work in what we're doing, but one could imagine perhaps other things. And, uh, and the formula I'm gonna present are very much going to exploit the interplay between uh, intersection theory, uh, topological intersection theory on this Archimedean symmetric space, which is the kind of thing that appears actually in Romain Branchel's thesis, for example, and something happening uh, with, the th uh, with the analytic, the rigid analytic functions or meromorphic functions on this piadic symmetric space. Okay, so um, I want to associate a certain quantity to this orthogonal group together with a maximal torus in the orthogonal group G. So I'm going to call T such a maximal torus. I assume that it's uh, R split, it's split over R. So the uh, it's real points, it's just isomorphic to two R copies of, uh, or sorry, to R copies of R star, okay? Uh, now, for such a torus, uh, there's a general classification of tori in orthogonal groups. The, the Q points of such a torus are all identified with L1 star, where L is a totally real etal algebra. So a product of fields, of finite extensions of Q, equipped with an involution, lambda goes to lambda prime. And the L1 star, this subscript of one, denotes the elements which are of norm one relative to this involution. So lambda, lambda prime is equal to one. Now, uh, if I take the subalgebra of L, of this uh, field, of this etal algebra, which is fixed by the involution, I'll call it F, instead of lambda, such that lambda is equal to lambda prime. So L is, L is a quadratic extension of this F, so to speak. And, but now the assumption I'm going to make about the torus is a non uh, is a strong condition, strong assumption about how the torus is actually globally non-split. I'm going to assume that L is a totally real field, not just an etal algebra, not a product of fields, but really just one field. And even more than that, I'm going to assume that there's a prime P for which the tensor product of L with QP remains a field. So this prime P then has to be uh, there's a, a unique prime of L, which lies above P. Okay, so that's a rather strong assumption on the torus being non-split at P. Okay. And so this is an essential assumption. The next one is just to simplify things a little bit. Uh, I'm going to assume that the sub ring of L, which preserves the lattice V. So V, remember, was a Z module, right? And that in general would be a no order. In, uh, in L, and I'm going to assume that it's the maximal order, the ring of integers of L. Okay. Now, the, the action of this torus, the, the rational points on the torus T, it becomes diagonalizable over the tensor product of V with the field L. I and mean, of course, there the action splits completely and decomposes VL into a direct sum of one-dimensional eigenspaces. 
And I'm going to fix an eigenline a subspace of dimension one, which is preserved, which is fixed by the torus action in VL. Okay. And uh, so this C is isotropic. And therefore, it gives rise to an element of XP after choosing an embedding of L into CP. So then you just uh, uh, base extend, uh, change scalars to CP by this embedding. And that gives you an isotropic line. And the condition of L being a field after tensing with QP sort of ensures that this C is never uh, orthogonal to any QP rational isotropic line. So it really belongs to uh, XP. It's a really a point. So that was one of the justifications for making this assumption on, on L being non-split at P, so that I get a point in this symmetric space. And in addition, at the on the Archimedean side, at infinity, uh, I have two R real embeddings because L is, is a totally real field. So I have two R, it's a totally field of degree two R. And these uh, real embeddings of L, they come in pairs because I, I, I group together an embedding and the one which differs from it by composition with this automorphism prime. So I have uh, then uh, two R vectors, uh, two R lines, rather C1, C1 prime up to CR, CR R prime, which are contained in the tensor product of V with the real numbers and are uh, isotropic lines there. And these uh, lines are all mutually orthogonal to each other, except that Cj and Cj prime uh, pair to something non-zero. So they give a natural decomposition of Vr as a direct sum of R hyperbolic planes, okay, over R. Okay, so now to these, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to now de describe certain Archimedean cycles, which are associated with this torus, and those are, they generalize the, the geodesics on the upper half plane that were associated to the real quadratic tau. Okay, so... Um, now, if I have an R tuple of positive real numbers, I can consider the R linear span of the vectors T1, C1 minus T1, C1 prime. So here I, I made an abusive notation. I'm just choosing a, a, a vector in that isotropic line, which I'm calling C1. And I take this thing and then up to TR, CR minus TR inverse CR prime. Now, these R vectors are mutually orthogonal to each other, and they all have negative inner product of themselves, they have negative length. And so this uh, plane, which is spanned by these R vectors is negative definite. So I get a collection of negative definite uh, planes of dimension R, one for each uh, uh, R tuple of real numbers. And uh, so then I can then use that to define a cycle, a cycle of dimension R, which is the collection of all these pi C of T1 TR as T1 TR range over the positive real numbers. So that's a subspace of X in, a sub a cycle in X infinity of um, of dimension R. So this delta C is an R dimensional topological cycle in the Archimedean symmetric space. Now, give it a vector of positive length. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You you impose here the TR to be positive, but then that depends on the choice of the of the embeddings psi i because. So, yeah, right, so right, right, fine. You're completely right. Yeah. So here, maybe I should have said this. Uh, I I said I mean, that this, but then I actually kind of normalize the. You know, it's, I, I take these vectors that's in these lines, but I normalize my choices so that these inner products are always positive. Um, no, but it depends more on the order than on the positivity of that thing. Like, who is Cj and who is Cj prime? Yeah, so Cj is a vector in the line, and Cj prime is its conjugate. Yeah, but okay. what I mean is you could have chosen the conjugate, and then in your next definition, when you impose the Ti to be positive, it exchanges to... So yeah, in the next I think... line... I, I make so... the choice. Okay, so you, you're right. I could... so, so you fix the choice once and for all, and then for this choice, you define these... Yeah, that's another way of, of saying it exactly. Exactly. So you, uh, I, I mean, I I choose the sign of these t's in such a way that the corresponding vectors are going to be uh, uh, of negative length. Okay. So if, if the c one c one prime was negative, right? I would put a plus here, not a minus. Okay. Okay. So you okay? You would you would adjust them so that they are all positive. Okay. 
Thanks. I mean, you know, the design things to some extent are a little bit a matter of convention because I could have defined my symmetric space as the set of all positive definite subspaces as well. Uh, if I have a negative definite subspace, I think it's orthogonal complement that's going to be a positive one. So the two spaces would be a natural bijection to each other. So in the literature, okay. you will see, you know, both conventions being used more or less. It's not very essential. Okay. Uh, well, just have to be consistent, of course, with this. Stuff. But so I, I I choose it in such a way that is negative definite, and then I get this cycle. Now, in parallel, I also want to associate certain cycles to the positive vectors in my lattice. So if I have a v and v with positive length, I can consider the negative uh, r planes, which are orthogonal to v. So v is positive. This orthogonal complement is going to be a signature r minus one r. So we will contain certain uh, negative definite subspaces. And it's one can show, it's not hard to see that this delta V is of co-dimension R in X infinity. So it has dimension R squared minus R. And in particular, these cycles delta V and the cycles delta C, they are of complementary dimensions. Their sum of dimensions is R squared. And therefore we can talk about the topological intersection. Uh, it should be some, and it's always, turns out to be always zero, one, or minus one. And it's completely well-defined. There are no issues of, um, of a non-transverse intersection, of degenerate intersection in the setting which I'm describing now, where L is a field. You always have a well-defined, uh, very simple kind of intersection number. Okay. Uh, so this is going to allow me then to define certain piadic class invariants attached to this uh, torus T in the setting. So I let V of one over P be simply the lattice V tensor with Z of one over P. So I turn it into a Z of one over P lattice. And the Z of one over P lattice, so it's a, it's a, a rank a two R uh, Z module, uh, sorry, Z of one over P module, free over Z of one over P of rank two R. I can also write it as a direct limit, an increasing union of the Z lattices P to the minus N times V. And this, this expression, of the Z of one over P lattice as an increasing union of Z lattices is gonna be useful uh, shortly. Um, okay, so then I consider the following expression. I take the product over all vectors in the Z of one over P lattice of a given length M, and I look at the orbits under the Z, the integer points of the torus. So I look at T of Z. The non-split assumption is, implies that T of Z and T of Z of one over P are essentially the same. So it doesn't really matter whether I choose the Z points or the Z of one over P points. So I look at these orbits of vectors of length M. And I look at this simple expression. I take the inner part of V with C and V with C prime, and I divide by the inner product of C and C prime. Now, this expression here, it it depends a priori on the choice of a vector in these isotropic lines. But you can see that it, in fact, does not because uh, here Xi prime is the conjugate of Xi. And so if I rescale Xi, this entire ratio will be unchanged. So it's a really canonical invariant attached to Xi and V. And I take this uh, element and I raise it to the power of the topological intersection of the cycle delta V of the previous slide with the cycle delta Xi. Okay, so that's my JM of C. Uh, and again, this because of this factor here, I mean, this set is infinite, but this factor makes the number of terms appearing in the product, which are not equal to one, finite. Um, oh, no, sorry, sorry. No, I, I take it back. I mean, I, I'm taking now the product over V of one over P. So if I've been taking the product over a Z lattice, I would get a finite product, but having inverted P, this becomes an infinite product. But I define it, one has to be careful in defining this infinite product. I, I define it to be the limit of the JMNs, where JMN is the product over this thing, the P to the minus NV mod T of Z. And now this product here is a finite product. Okay, and, but I take I allow N to increase and tend to infinity to get my JM of C. Okay. And uh, if you... So in addition to these JMNs, it's useful to introduce a J phi N attached to any weakly holomorphic, well, and, and here to any formal uh, power uh, Laurent series in Q, okay? Uh, if I have a phi like this, then I define G J phi N to be the weighted product of the JMNs raised to the power AMs, these coefficients that appear in the principal part of the, of the phi. 
Okay, so that's my J and J phi n of C. Okay, and then the theorem on is it basically going to be an algebraicity result about the value J phi of C, um, which generalizes the previous result on, on, on real quadratic senior modulus. So the theorem is if phi is a weakly holomorphic modular form of weight two minus R. So two minus R is kind of the complementary weight to weight R um, and level P, then the following limit exists in QP, or not in QP, but in, in uh, FP, in the completion of F at P. So this J phi of C is just the limit as n goes to infinity of the J phi n's. And it belongs, so a priori it's just a piadic number, which belongs to the piadic completion of F, but it actually belongs to the narrow Hilbert class field of L relative to a suitable embedding of that Hilbert class field into the completion. So it belongs to this narrow class, Hilbert class field up to torsion. Okay. So the case of, as I alluded to before, the case of real quadratic singular modulo can be recovered from this more general result uh, by setting R equals two, uh, V to be again, this uh, four dimensional space M2 of Z, L to be the bi-quadratic field Q square root D1 square root D2, F is this uh, quadratic subfield of a bi-quadratic field, and the isotropic line or the isotropic vector is this one here, which belongs to this uh, tensor product of V with CP. So that's the vector that. So if you plug those into the formula, you will recover that earlier formula I gave you. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to say, um, give you a little bit of an idea of what goes into the proofs of these results. And it turns out that there's even some conceptual clarity to be gained by treating the general case. It doesn't make uh, the proof uh, much more complicated and even make simplifies it on some conceptual level. Because, um, yeah. So uh, the main thing, the main object in the proof are certain Hilbert modular theta series, which are associated to finite order Hecke characters of the field L. Okay, so. Uh, I remind you a little bit the notation uh, involving uh, finite order Hecke characters. If I have, I consider I sub L to be the group of fractional ideals of L, uh, and P L to be the group of principal ideals having a totally positive generator. Uh, so the uh, quotients of I L by P L classically is what we call the narrow class group of L, and uh, a character of this narrow class group we say that it's of mixed signature. If its value on, on principal ideal is the sign of the product. Remember that we have these two R real embeddings of L into, re, into R, but we group them together according to when they differ by, by this prime. And so we chose for each prime of, of uh, for each Archimedean place of F, we chose a real embedding of L that lies above it. And I call A1 up to AR, the images of A under these R distinct real embeddings. And I take the sign of the product. And if that's, uh, if psi satisfies this, we say that it's of mixed signature. So it's sort of, sort of even and odd at each of the real places lying above any real place of F. Now, if psi is of mixed signature, the reason why this, these characters are useful for us is that when we look at the induced representation from L to F, we get a two-dimensional representation of the Gawa group of F. And this two-dimensional representation is odd at all the Archimedean places of F. So it's an odd, it has eigenvalues one and minus one uh, when evaluated each of the Frobenius elements attached to the R Archimedean places of F. And we know that such odd uh, Galois representations of F, Archean representations, ought to correspond to a holomorphic Hilbert modular forms of parallel weight one. And in this case, the the, the forms that correspond to these induced representations are the classical Hilbert modular theta series, which I'm going to describe now quickly. So we can define a function on the integral ideals of F, depending on this Hecke character psi, by saying that C psi of an ideal A of F is the sum of the psi of J, where J ranges over all the ideals of norm A. Okay, so that's the, the function on ideals. And then we can write down certain generating series, which are indexed by the elements new in a certain, the totally positive elements of certain ideals of F. And so I write theta psi of I to be the sum over the news of this ideal of C psi principal ideal J by new times, sorry, times uh, I inverse, T 
times q to the new, which is just a shorthand, of course, for the usual thing you see in the theory of Hilbert modular forms. Okay, so this is a Hilbert modular form of parallel weight one on a certain congruent subgroup of SL2F, which is essentially of level one under my assumption that uh, OL preserved the lattice, et cetera, and that the lattice was of, of a discriminant one. Okay, now I want to bring in some abelian extensions of L, so for the, the, the next part of the proof. So if I have an abelian extension in, in this context of level one, where everything is unramified, so to speak, this H would just be the narrow Hilbert class field of the extension L. So this would be an abelian extension of L, but it would also be, in fact, a Galois over F. Right? It, 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 it's Galois, but not necessarily abelian over F. And I'm going to write G for the Galois group of H over L. And G plus, so the involution in Gal L over F induces an involution on G which I again denote by prime. And I let G plus be the subgroup of G, which is invariant under this involution. And G minus the quotient of G by this G plus. And so you have the following diagram of field extension. So you have your F, which is the base field, totally real. This quadratic extension L corresponding to the, the torus in the orthogonal group. And then you have this G, the cover of H over L, which decomposes as a subgroup G plus and a quotient G minus. And this H minus is actually Galois over F, and its Galois group is a generalized dihedral group uh, where this involution acts as minus one on this G minus. And so we're focusing particularly on primes P of F, which remain inert in L over F. And so the Frobenius in Gal H minus over F, which is associated to this P, is actually an element of order two. It's a reflection in this dihedral group, which means that this prime P has to split completely in H minus over L. And then the splitting behavior of this primes in H over H minus is immaterial. It, it sort of splits in some way. Uh, but what really matters in the construction is that we have this behavior of P being totally split in this uh, extension H minus. Okay, so the crucial result that really allows us to, to prove things is the theory of deformations of these modular forms and their associated Galois representations. So I fix a prime P, which is in, inert in L over F, and I consider this theta function. And the main result is that this theta function admits a first order ordinary piatic deformation of the following form. So here you, rec you recognize the coefficient I hope that you people see, I have my cursor moving over the slides. I hope you see it, yeah. So this is just the coefficient of the original Hilbert modular theta series. And then you add in this infinitesimal term, so the epsilon is just a shorthand for its element of square zero. Uh, and you just add this piatic logarithm of the corresponding element in u times q to the nu. So this is kind of a not terribly interesting kind of deformation of the modular form. But then there are these extra coefficients which crop up which only occur for the coefficient at the coefficients of the original theta series, which were zero. So one of the features of theta series is that when you look at their Q expansions, they're fairly lacunary. Any uh, element in U which corresponds, which is divisible by an ideal, which is inert, for example, the corresponding Fourier coefficient has to vanish. Uh, but in this first order deformation, you get this uh, interesting sometimes uh, Fourier coefficient. And what characterizes S psi of nu I inverse is that, so this is, a, this is a function on ideals. It can be written as a linear combination of SG of A's as G ranges over the Galois group of H over L. And the crucial point is that the coefficients that arise here are piatic logarithms of algebraic numbers in H minus star. So in the, in the multiplicative group of this abelian extension of L. So this is the crucial thing, the crucial phenomenon, because we see the algebraic numbers that we were trying to construct appearing as the first order, as the Fourier coefficients of first order deformations of these Hilbert theta series. So that's the source of the algebraic numbers. And I won't give you, the, the formula for these SGAs is quite involved in general, but as a special case, SG of PQ, if I take a product of two primes, P and Q, which are both inert in L over F, then I can take uh, I, the recipe for it is that this is going to be the P prime attic logarithm of a unit U of Q prime. This U of Q prime is an element of H minus. 
and it's chosen so that it has valuation one at Q prime. So Q prime is just some prime of, of, of H minus above Q that has valuation one there and valuation zero everywhere else. And I take the P prime attic logarithm of that. And these P prime and Q prime are pairs of lifts. They're chosen to have a certain compatibility relation, which is that if I look at the two Frobenius elements attached to P prime and Q prime, these are canonical elements in my dihedral group, the Gauss group of L over F. And I want that this element G, which occurs here, is the product of these two reflections. So this is now an element of gal uh, H over uh, over L. Okay. And so that's the I'm formula. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, do, do you have a cohomological interpretation of this deformation by saying that the trivial deformations are like boundaries and the non-trivial are, are sort of co-cycles? I'm not sure. I, one of my goals is to give this lecture without saying the word co-cycle once. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course, the, the mechanism behind the proof of this result is the theory of deformations of Galois representations. So the specialization of this theta series, of course, just it's associated Galois representation is this uh, Artin representation, which is particularly simple. It's a, it's a dihedral type uh, representation. And when you look, when you analyze this first order deformations, you're led to consider Galois cohomology, the cohomology of the Galois group of F with values in the adjoint representation of this Artin representation. And out of that, you extract, out of really, really of class field theory for H minus in some sense, you see appearing these logarithms of algebraic numbers. So these very interesting coefficients really emerge naturally from the deformation theory of the Galois representation. So the, the, the log of the units are kind of the trivial deformations and then the ones in H star minus are the non-trivial ones. I don't know. Yeah, well, they're the deformations of uh, when your Frobenius element at the prime is a reflection. So uh, yeah, so these ones correspond to deformations where the Frobenius with the prime splits and therefore the uh, elements. So this Galois group of... of um, of H over H minus over F is a dihedral group. And if the Frobenius lands in gal H minus over L, uh, uh, yeah, over L, right? Then uh, we get these relatively straightforward terms coming up in the deformation. And then something interesting happens when the Frobenius is a reflection and you look at the deformation, you pick up some information about an extension class between two Galois, uh, between two one dimensional Galois representations. Uh, which gives you these numbers. Okay, so I, I, I'll leave it at that because I'm, I'm running out of time, but that's sort of what's going on. Okay, so now I can, now that I have this, I can just describe in one slide the proof, the remaining proof. So I first define an ideal, a fractional ideal in L, by taking the inner part of the Z, the Z lattice V with C, this L vector. That gives me a, a, a fractional ideal well defined up to homothesy. And I can look at and make an ideal of F by taking the norm from L down to F of this ideal divided by this C, C prime inverse. So this is actually canonical, not depending on the choice of the vector in C. And then I define a function on ideals by sending alpha, an ideal alpha, to the sine of A if alpha differs by this S by a principal element, by a principal ideal, and zero otherwise. So this function is not a character, but it's an odd function. It's a kind of mixed character function, I should say. And therefore, it can be expressed as a linear combination of characters. And that's going to be enough for me because I've analyzed the deformations of all the theta psi's for psi characters, mixed signature characters. I can then recover something about this thing. And I'm going to then consider the theta series associated to this function uh, and its Q expansion attached at the ideal i, so to speak. And so I get this first order thing by taking this uh, theta psi s tilde, and I take its derivative. In other words, it's a psilon term, the derivative with respect to a psilon. And so I get this. But the crucial thing is I take the Hilbert modular form and I look at its diagonal restriction to get a classical modular form over Q. And now this is just, I can write down its Q expansion. Now the Q expansion is indexed by integers m. Okay, so that's my diagonal restriction. And so this is actually, because it's the re diagonal restriction of this derivative, 
Uh, taking the derivative means I only get a piatic modular form, not a classical modular form. It's a piatic modular form of weight R and tame level one. Okay. And then the main point of the, of the proof is just the calculation of the Fourier coefficients of G. It turns out that if you calculate the MP to the nth Fourier coefficient of this piatic modular form, you get two contributions. The first is the piatic logarithm of this finite product, JMN of C. And the second contribution is the piatic logarithm of an R of M, where R of M belongs to this H minus star. Tensor Q. And this R of M, of course, is coming from, when you take the diagonal restriction, all the, these new Fourier coefficients in the deformation where the original uh, coefficients were zero in the theta series. And the crucial point, the, the crucial feature of the calculation is that this R of M depends on M, but it does not depend on the exponent N. So when you multiply M by powers of P, you do not change <laughs> this algebraic contribution. Okay, so then the key thing is to take the take this piatic modular form of weight R and look at its ordinary projection, where you just iterate the UP operator. And uh, if I write this now as a, as a Q expansion, this modular form is now a classical modular form of level P uh, because of how the uh, ordinary projection oper uh, behaves. And so this A of M is just a limit of a of m p to the n factorial. And uh, then of course here I just recovered the piatic log of jm of c plus the piatic log of this r of m. But now this a of m is the Fourier coefficient of a classical modular form of weight r and level p. So if there are no cl classical class forms of weight r and level p, then I'm done because this coefficient has to be zero and I recover the algebraicity of the log of jm of c from this. Uh, but more generally, the space of forms of, of uh, weight R and level P emerges as an obstruction to the algebraicity of these expressions. But that obstruction is controlled by shared duality by the principal parts of weakly holomorphic modular forms of the complementary weight 2 minus R. And that's what explains the, the formulation of the result I gave uh, before. Okay, so I'm going to finish now. I was actually at a further slide where I mentioned rigid homomorphic co-cycles, but since I had kind of promised myself to not try to not to mention co-cycles at all, I'll just skip that slide. And uh, uh, thank you for your attention.